Okay, so uh, let us get launched with today's topic which is query processing. So what kind of queries are we talking about here? Uh, do we mean RTI queries where not processing it will uh, if you are a responsible officer will get you a fine? No, what kind of queries are we talking about? Uh, we are talking about SQL queries primarily. However, our focus is not going to be on the SQL language. Instead, we are going to assume that the queries have been translated down into relational algebra. Many people were asking me early in the course, what is the motivation for relational algebra? And the motivation is it is a clean abstraction for the operations that any real system needs to do on uh, relations. And SQL is uh, translated into relational algebra in a relatively straightforward manner. It turns out that the basic relational al algebra operations which we have seen are not quite sufficient. There are a few extra operations. In particular, uh, people have extended relational algebra with an operation which models uh, subqueries, the uh, nested uh, subqueries and how they get executed. Uh, that was not really part of the relational algebra originally, but there are extended versions of relational algebra which have an operator modeling correlated subquery execution. So, uh, we are not going to go too much into correlated subqueries in this talk and we will stick to the basic relational algebra. But we will briefly discuss correlated subqueries at the end. So uh, here are the basic steps in query processing. You give a query in SQL typically, it is passed translated into relational algebra and that is fed to an optimizer. Now what does the optimizer do? It has to output an execution plan which is uh, expected to be the cheapest plan. Now, how does the optimizer uh, know what is the cost of various plans and how does it generate alternative plans? These are the two questions which we are going to look at in more detail in chapter 13, the next chapter which is also today. Uh, today's session was labeled big data. I do not know if we will be able to get up to big data today. Uh, what I will do is I will cover processing and optimization and we will start on big data at the end. So coming back, uh, we have uh, an optimizer which uh, has to look for alternative expressions which are equivalent and it takes statistics about data. What kind of statistics? For example, how many tuples are there in a particular relation? Uh, how many distinct values are there for a particular attribute? What is the distribution of values? Maybe a histogram or some such uh, to uh, estimate how many uh, tuples will satisfy a particular selection and so forth. So there's a lot of statistics which any database maintains. And using that, the optimizer chooses an execution plan. Now that plan is passed on to an evaluation engine, which takes the actual data from the database and processes the query and outputs the query result. So that is a summary of query processing. Uh, we have already seen these. Now first, uh, let us focus on the alternative uh, plans for a particular query. Let us start with the relational algebra expressions. And then we will uh, go deeper into actual uh, specific algorithms for evaluating specific relational algebra operations. So let us start with a very trivial query, it is not realistic, but still it shows what are the issues. Here is a query which says project uh, instructor on the salary attribute and then select salaries which are less than 75,000. Okay. So um, this is pretty straightforward. If you want to actually implement it, you would have to implement the project operator which would probably do a scan of the relation and assuming this is the SQL version which keeps duplicates, uh, it would simply do a scan and output just the salary attribute and ignore everything else. And then that result would then be passed on to the select operator which uh, filters out all those salaries which are uh, less than 75,000 and returns them and filters out the others and throws them out. Now it should be very clear that this particular expression is equivalent to this other expression which does what? It first does the select on salary and afterwards it does the project. Now these two are actually uh, you know fairly straight simple examples. The cost of the two may not vary all that drastically, but when you have uh, joins of a uh, number of relations. Uh, there are alternative uh, join orders which can be wa wildly varying in cost. We will come to that later. So now each of these operations, uh, select and project itself, 
can be executed using different algorithms. And we are going to see that in this chapter. What are the different algorithms for select, for project and so forth. Now an optimizer's job is to give out a execution plan or evaluation plan uh, which the uh, evaluation engine can directly execute. So that plan must specify exactly how to run this query including uh, how to do the select, how to do the project. For example, the plan may say uh, you know use an index on salary to find instructors with salary less than 75,000. The alternative is to look at all instructors and apply the selection condition to see if the salary is less than 75,000. Now which plan is cheaper? It turns out it depends. It depends on what kind of an index it is, whether it is clustered or not clustered, on salary and so forth. So the job of the optimizer is to look at these in pieces of information, what indices are there, are they clustered and so forth and determine which of these plans is likely to be cheaper. So as I already said, query optimization's goal is to find the cheapest plan. It can't actually find the real cheapest in terms of actually executing it because you can't exactly predict how long a particular plan will take. Instead, we estimate how long it will take based on statistics. The estimate may not exactly match the actual uh, execution time, but it's usually a reasonable predictor and as long as you have a plan which is close to optimal, and you don't choose a plan which is really way off, you're okay. So I've been talking of the cost, uh, how to estimate the cost of uh, evaluation of a query. And one simple measure of cost is how long will it take? You start the query and see when it finishes. Now, how long it takes is a function of what other queries are running in the system uh, and uh, you know, is some other uh, activity going on in the operating system while queries are running. It's so on. So that is hard to predict. But what you can estimate is the resource consumption. How much resources is this particular query going to consume? So what are the resources? Uh, it could be disk access, it would include CPU time and in a system which is uh, running queries in parallel or in distributed manner, it would include network communication cost. Now typically uh, in uh, hard disk based databases, disk access has been the predominant cost. This is changing with uh, flash memory, uh, but for simplicity, let us uh, focus on the uh, disk accesses as a measure because it is easier to uh, understand what is going on at an abstract level. What about the CPU cost itself? Every optimizer does model CPU cost and there are ways to model it. For example, uh, you know, each algorithm can estimate how many operations to do and then give some relative weightage of CPU cost versus disk cost because depending on how fast your CPU is and how fast your disk is, uh, you know, the relative cost may be different. So you have to combine the cost in some way to get an overall cost. That is what any real optimizer does. For simplicity, we are only going to look at disk access and here again, there are several factors in disk access. There are three things which we actually need to model. One is the number of seeks uh, which are done and uh, then we are going to multiply it by the average seek cost. Now the exact cost for a particular seek uh, depends on which block you are, which track the disk arm is at and which is the uh, track which you need to access. This is for a single disk subsystem. For a multiple uh, disk subsystem, there are other issues to which all disks are you reading. Um, and uh, also it all depends on what else is in the queue for that disk. So we can't uh, figure that out at optimization time, so we take an average cost. Uh, similarly, a plan, uh, given a particular plan, we can estimate how many blocks are read. Given we know the number of blocks read, we will multiply it by average block read cost. And similarly, we will estimate the number of blocks written and multiply that by the block write cost. Now why do we differentiate between read and write cost? Writes are usually more expensive. On disk, a write requires uh, typically that the uh, disk uh, spin around completely and the data is read again before the write is declared successful. On the other hand, uh, some systems will mask this by um, writing data to a non-volatile buffer and return a write done immediately. In fact, some disk subsystems will mask this further 
by not actually doing the write to disk at some point and keeping it in the main memory buffer and say done, write done. Uh, do we need to uh, worry about these differences? Not really yet. For the purpose of query optimization, this is not relevant. What we want is the actual disk resources which are consumed by this particular write operation. We do not care about the uh, actual time delays that are introduced um, for the purpose of comparing plans. Okay. So, as I said, uh, we are going to just focus on uh, transfer and seek. In fact, we are going to simplify our life further and not bother too much about whether we are doing a read or a write. We could, it is just that to keep your life simpler, we have simplified the formulae and just count the number of block transfers, whether it is read or write, we will treat it uniformly. And the number of seeks, we will keep separate. And this matters because there are some algorithms which transfer less data, but do more seeks and vice versa. Now, depending on whether you are using flash memory or hard disk, uh, the cost of seek and the cost of transfer can be pretty different. So, uh, you want to keep these separate. So, uh, we are going to uh, have the number of blocks B, which we are transferring times the average transfer time for one block. And then the number of seeks S that we do uh, times the uh, average time for one seek. And we are going to ignore CPU costs. Uh, we will also note this last point here, our cost estimates do not take into account the cost of writing the output to the disk. And the reason for this is many algorithms create output. Uh, sometimes you have to write that output to disk in order to uh, start the next operation. So, you have to write it out completely before you start the next operation. In some other cases, you can actually pass the output of one operation directly to the next without writing it out to disk. So, depending on the overall plan, the data may or may not get written to disk. So, at when we are estimating the cost of an operator, we will not include the cost of writing the final output. Again, uh, there are issues with buffers, um, which we are going to ignore. Um, so, I did not want to show you the slide, because you would be tempted to read it. But the bottom line is, uh, an algorithm in general has to read data from disk, but the data which it wants might already be in the disk buffer. In which case, the cost of seek and transfer is totally avoided. It is much cheaper. The problem is that the query optimizer really has no clue what is in the database buffer. Because it is coming up with a plan right now. By the time the plan is actually executed, the contents of the buffer may change dramatically. There has been some work on trying to do optimization, taking buffer residence into account. Uh, but it is hard to predict. So, typically, optimizers do not bother about it. Now, why is this a reasonable thing to do? Well, you know, it actually depends. Uh, the plan assumes worst case, meaning nothing is in the buffer, and it will uh, tend to favor a plan which uh, fetches the smallest amount of data with fewer seeks. Now, there may be another plan uh, which uh, reads more data, uh, which would be much slower if the data were on disk, but might be cheaper if data were in memory. Mm. So, the relative cost of plans might be affected by this. Uh, but the general accepted wisdom is that uh, the relative cost of plans may not change as much. The actual time to execute will reduce drastically if data is in memory. But if you have two options, plan A and plan B, what is the relative cost when data is not in memory versus the relative cost when the data is already in memory? And the assumption, which you know, it is an assumption, which is not always true, in fact. But the assumption to simplify life is that the relative cost will not change all that much. So, if you choose a plan assuming worst case, uh, nothing is in buffer. When we run it with everything in buffer, uh, the plan which was better in the worst case is not too much worse than the best plan when things are in buffer. So, that is the assumption. Now, let us look at specific algorithms. If you have a complex selection uh, and you do not have and or you do not have indices, the only way to answer that selection is to read every record in the file containing the that relation and then look at the record and see if it matches the selection condition. So, this particular algorithm we will call file scan or linear search. File scan means read everything in the file and this algorithm is called linear search. It can be applied regardless of the condition, ordering, availability of indices and so forth. Now, when you search for data in memory, uh, binary search is sometimes viewed as an option on sorted data. 
this usually doesn't make sense in databases because first of all the data is not stored sequentially in a sorted array it's stored on disk and b uh, binary search can be much more expensive uh, than having a proper b plus tree index the number of seeks will be much less with a b plus tree index which brings up to the us to the next algorithm index scan when can we use index scan when we have a condition that matches an index we have created so supposing we have built an index on attribute id of student and i get a selection select uh, id equal to 1 2 3 4 5 student so i want the student whose id is 1 2 3 4 5 now a b plus tree on the id attribute is perfectly suited to this query and that's probably what i would use for this so that corresponds to a primary index or a clustered index with an equality on key id is a key attribute so equality on key it retrieves a single record that satisfies the equality condition now what is the cost of doing this index select um, i'm going to assume that the height of the index is hi the ith index which we are using here its height is hi now remember what happens when we use a b plus tree we start at the root we compare the key value then go to the one of the children compare key values go to its child until we hit a leaf so the total height is hi when we hit a leaf the assumption is that we will get a record pointer and we'll do one more io to fetch the actual record so hi plus 1 ios are involved each of those ios involves a, a seek followed by a transfer so this is the cost hi plus 1 times t transfer plus t seek this is the formula we will use now if i had an index which was a cluster index but the selection was the index was on something which is not a key so let's take the same student relation and instead of clustering the relation on id supposing we cluster it on department name and i have a query uh, find all students in the cs department here i have a clustered index um, so i can go down the index to find the first record in the cs department or student record in the cs department and then all the other student records are going to be consecutive why because this is a primary or clustered index that means the actual relation is sorted on the department in this example so i'm going to read a number of consecutive blocks which all contain relevant data so let b be the number of blocks containing matching records so you can take the estimated number of matching records divided by how many records fit in a block to estimate this so the cost here is hi times uh, the transfer plus seek to get to the leaf and then after that there is one seek to reach the first block containing the required data and then i'm going to read b consecutive blocks i'm assuming that the leaves uh, of the b plus tree are stored reasonably consecutive it cannot be exactly consecutive but the idea is if i am able to store things such that you know a block of uh, let's say uh, 50 pages will be stored consecutively then only once in 50 uh, page reads will require a seek so that's not too much so we can ignore it so we are going to assume that all the things are consecutive and we are going to not do further seeks and b consecutive blocks we are going to read so t transfer times b blocks so that's an estimate for primary index equality on non key but this is also pretty efficient because the transfer uh, rate is pretty high the time to transfer one block is usually very small uh, remember we can read data from this these days at something like 50 megabytes to 100 megabytes a second that's pretty good now the next case uh, is uh, secondary index equality on non key uh, by the way there is one more case uh, which is secondary index equality on key which i have not uh, shown here uh, but that turns out to be similar to uh, primary index uh, equality on key uh, what i mean is if the uh, key is unique i'm only fetching one record then whether it's a primary index or secondary index doesn't really matter this cost will be the same but the cost difference comes when i have a secondary index with an equality on a non key so what do i mean by equality on non key the secondary index is going to give me a number of records but these records are going to be scattered all over the underlying uh, file so what is going to happen is um, if i want a single record to be fetched which is the equality on key I'll traverse down the index and then follow another uh, uh, pointer to the actual record. 
So, H i plus 1 and each of these involves a seek followed by a single block transfer. So, this is the cost for when it is a uh, search key is a candidate key, but equality on non key is a more general case and here we have let us say n matching records. The problem is each of these n matching records may be on a different block. So, what is going to happen is uh, I am going to have n separate I O operations for each of those matching records. So, each operation is on a different block. Let us assume that the relation is a large relation and these are random I O's. Now, when I fetch a particular block and the buffer is full, I have to evict something. When I fetch the next block, I evict something else. If the relation is significantly larger than the buffer, what will happen is most of the time when I fetch a block, it is not going to be in the buffer. The probability of finding a block in the buffer will be small if the buffer is very small relative to the relation size. Now, this is again a worst case assumption we are making. If the relation is actually very small, uh, the actual running time will be much less. So, uh, people have indeed taken this into account and a more realistic formula which many databases implement takes into account how big the relation is and how big the buffer is. But for simplicity, we are using the worst case. In the worst case, the buffer is very small and every one of these n separate I O operations will result in a seek and a block transfer. So, I am going to have H i plus n times T transfer plus T seek. This can turn out to be very expensive and in reality too, it is not just a you know theoretical thing. If you actually do this with a relatively small memory and large relation, the cost of seeks dominates because seeks is much, much more expensive than data transfer for a single block. So, seeks will dominate and it turns out that an secondary index on a non key can actually become a liability, uh, a simple file scan might be much faster. So, this was the state of affairs. Uh, so, uh, the optimizer has to estimate how many matching records would be there and then choose whether to use the secondary index or to do a file scan. Now, this was a little problematic. How well can the optimizer estimate how many records will match? It turns out this is not easy necessarily. Uh, supposing uh, the uh, query is on uh, let us say country, I am I am trying to find all orders from a particular country or from a city let us say particular city. Now, if you take the number of orders from Mumbai for something if, uh, say Flipkart, it is going to be way bigger than the number of orders from I do not know some other small town. So, if the optimizer does not have exact statistics about how many orders are from which town it might make some simplifying assumptions and say that on average each town has so many orders. So, now if I do it for Mumbai, the number is going to be way more than the average. If the actual number were equal to or less than the average, this n might be small and it might be worth doing separate seeks per order. But if it is Mumbai, this cost blows up and you are better off doing a file scan. Uh, so, the optimizer somehow had to do its best and if it did not do a good job, uh, this thing could blow up in its face. So, this was the state of affairs uh, till people decided you could have hybrid algorithms. So, I am going to go uh, off the slides and use my whiteboard to spend a minute on an algorithm which Postgres implements, which is called the uh, bitmap index scan. Okay. So, Postgres SQL. has something called bitmap index scan and in the lab today you will actually be uh, seeing query plans and uh, it is actually not hard to uh, look at what plan the optimizer has chosen for a particular query. In PostgreSQL it is like explain and give a query, whatever query select star from the select uh, star from student where id equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever it is. If you just prefix it with an explain, uh, PostgreSQL will tell you what plan it is using. So, you, uh, your uh, lab exercise is to look at these plans. Uh, there are actually two exercises in today's lab. One part is on creating indices and seeing the impact of the index on the plan and on the running time of various queries. And the second part is uh, trying out uh, various queries and seeing the plan 
and seeing the impact of uh, indices on the plant, seeing the impact of different uh, joint selection conditions and so on on the plant. So, coming back, uh, PostgreSQL has something called the bitmap index scan, which by the way should be uh, passed as bitmap index scan with a hyphen there. Do not confuse this with bitmap indices. Bitmap indices are described in uh, chapter 11. I didn't cover it in detail yesterday for lack of time. But for those of you who are interested, uh, it's there in the slides, it's there in the chapter. But that is a separate concept. What PostgreSQL calls as bitmap index scan is different from bitmap indices. It's completely different. In fact, PostgreSQL does not have bitmap indices as of now. So, what is the bitmap index scan? The idea is that, you know, I have a B plus tree. And um, I'm scanning down here. Let's say this is on city, and uh, I find a number of record IDs here for the particular city that I'm looking at. It could be Mumbai, it could be uh, Gudwancheri, or wherever. Now, the optimizer is not sure uh, how many responses are going to be there. If the optimizer is pretty sure, it will just do a regular index lookup. Uh, it's not going to use the bitmap index. However, if the optimizer is not sure, it does what is called a bitmap index scan. And the idea is that when it comes down here, uh, it looks at all the uh, record IDs that are stored at the leaf. Okay, the B plus tree is going to store record IDs. This is a secondary index. So, it will have record IDs. So, now what it will do is it creates a bitmap. What is a bitmap? It's simply an array of bits. So, one bit per uh, block of uh, file with uh, the, uh, say let us say this is on a sales relation, where city is one of the attributes. So, uh, there is one bit per block of the file containing sales. So, that is uh, the uh, data structure which is used and that is why it is called bitmap index scan. Now, this uh, bitmap data structure is pre-built in the case of bitmap indices, but here it is not pre-built. It is going to be built on the fly. What happens is we go through all the record IDs here. There is a list of record IDs which we fetch from the index and we will go through all these record IDs and the record ID has a page number. So, what it will do is mark the bit as 1, supposing that record ID was from the fourth page. So, these are the bits. Okay, so, the fourth page, the bit is set to 1. Initially, all the bits are 0. So, I will show them as blank. And let us say the first one is from the fourth page. And the next one is from the second page. So, that bit will be set to 1. The third one was from page 7. So, you set that bit to 1. The next one may be from page 1. So, you will set that bit to 1. So, what we have now is a number of bits which are 1 and then the other bits are 0. I will make the zeros explicit here now. Okay, so, now what is done is a file scan of the sales relation is done, but during the scan I am only going to fetch pages where the bit is set to 1. If the bit is set to 0, I will not fetch the page. Now, what is the point of this optimization? Now, I am not doing random IO. I am reading the uh, sales relation sequentially with no seeks essentially. Seeks are very rare in effect. We uh, will pretend there are no seeks. So, with no seeks, I am just reading the relation consecutively, but I am just skipping over pages which whose bits are set to 0. So, I do not incur the cost of uh, fetching those pages. So, theoretically there is a seek, uh, because if you are skipping a bunch of pages which are on, uh, the next page is on another track, yes you have to seek to the next track, uh, but those seeks are cheap. And if I have a long string of consecutive zeros, there is a seek which may be a little longer, uh, but it is still a local seek, not a seek which is uh, to the other end of disk, most likely. Again, there is no guarantee as I said, uh, we do not have control on the placement of data on disk. 
uh, but the number of actual long seeks required here is going to be much, much less. So we can ignore it. So the number of pages fetched is now small. We are not doing a full scan which would fetch a lot of pages. We are only fetching a few pages. And moreover, because the data is being accessed in order, the number of seeks is much less. So what is happening now is that I'm only fetching relevant pages and I'm avoiding the seeks. So if the number of pages were just one or two, the overhead of creating this bitmap, setting the bits and then going over it would be unnecessary, but it's not a big overhead anyway. But in, if in fact I had lots of records here, lots of records matching, then many of the bits may be set to one. So if I had done a secondary index scan and directly accessed these records, I would jump from here to there to there to there. And assuming this is a large relation, most of the time the data would not be in the buffer and I would be doing an actual I.O. So the cost would be very high. Now what is happening is when I bring a page in, if that page had five matching records, I'm going to get them all together because I'm just getting the page and then scanning the page to find all matching records. So earlier I would have done five separate I.O.s in the worst case for that page because there were five separate records with five separate entries in the index. But now when I fetch that page, I'll fetch it exactly once. I will find all the five records by scanning inside the page and then that page is gone and that's it. I don't have to look at that page again. So each page will be fetched at most once and the number of seeks will be pretty small. So it's a very efficient strategy. So this is actually a very nice algorithm. Uh, you can think of it as a hybrid, hybrid between index scan or ind index lookup. I'll call it, it's called index scan in the, uh, uh, in the practical uh, community which builds databases. Uh, it's a hybrid between index scan and uh, file scan, which is scanning the entire set of records in the relation. Okay, so you, when you uh, do today's lab, you're going to see uh, several occurrences of a bitmap index scan. In fact, if you see the plan, it will have another operation called recheck predicate or recheck filter or re I think it's called recheck or maybe refilter. And the idea is that uh, when I fetch this page whose bit is set to one, that page has some relevant records but it may also have a lot of irrelevant records. So uh, because I'm just going through all the records in the page, I'm not going back to the index. I'm just going through all the records in the page uh, in order to find um, which records satisfy the selection. That is the rechecking of the predicate in the first, which was used also from the index. Now why don't I just keep all the record IDs here and then fetch it. And the idea is the number of record IDs may be pretty large. Uh, so keeping that may be expensive. It's easier to just read the block and filter in there. Okay, I hope that is reasonably clear. So let's uh, come back to our selections using indices. So now there are, uh, those were the basic algorithms. Now what about complex selections? Um, what we saw so far would be selections like r equal to a, r, uh, sorry, r dot a equal to 5, r dot a between 7 and 27 and such like. But conditions can be conjunctions. What do we do? Uh, if I have a condition um, on two attributes, both of which are equality, um, what do I do? Maybe I could use a composite multi-key index if it is available. That's this algorithm. On the other hand, if it's not available, uh, let's say I have a selection on a student where department equal to comp psi and um, what are the other attributes there? We have total credits, total credits greater than 100. So I can use the department index to find uh, relevant records IDs. I can uh, find uh, the uh, relevant things for uh, total credits greater than 100. And uh, so I have a choice. So what I will do is I may pick whichever is the cheapest of these two estimated. If the number of uh, records with uh, department equal to comp psi is small, uh, then maybe that index would be good. I will find all the records with comp psi and then I will apply, I will fetch the records and apply the condition that total credits greater than 100. 
On the other hand, if the optimizer decides that most people have less than 100 credits, so it's more efficient to find who all have less than 100 or greater than 100 credits, fetch the records, and then apply the filter on department name. That plan is chosen. So that is um, algorithm A7. And then there is uh, there are a few other algorithms which I have not shown here. Uh, one of which is uh, I'll fetch the record IDs using both these indices, and then I will uh, intersect the record IDs to find which satisfy both the conditions. Uh, by the way, A7 can be used if I have even one of the indices. I don't need in indices on all the selection conditions. So maybe one of the conditions involves an indexed column, another condition is on a column which is not indexed, that's not a problem. I can use the index column and uh, you know, use that index and then test the other one after fetching the uh, record into the buffer. So the bottom line is given any uh, selection condition, there are many possible algorithms which have different costs and it's the job of the optimizer to pick the cheapest algorithm amongst these. Okay, so the next topic is uh, how to do the remaining operations. And it turns out there are two basic ways of doing all the other, pretty much all the other operations. And they are based on sorting and hashing. So all of these algorithms are going to work even if the uh, underlying relations are much bigger than memory. You know, this is one of the nice things about databases. They don't die if the data is larger than memory. Things which people hand built earlier had this problem that they would work perfectly fine with small data. The moment your database size became bigger than memory, they would die. Databases don't behave like this. They behave very nicely even on very large data. So what is the trick? The trick is to use algorithms which uh, sort the data or we'll also see hash partitioning of the data um, so that even if it's large, uh, it'll still work. So the very first algorithm is sorting. So how do you sort? Uh, data which is much larger than memory. And we will use sorting as underlying infrastructure for many other operations. So uh, this is the external sort merge algorithm. I'm going to show you the picture first and then describe the algorithm. So here is a picture showing this algorithm. So first uh, we have the initial data which is big and it's not sorted. Our goal is to sort it on the first column, okay, the first letter here. Now, to, for illustrative purposes, I'm going to assume that memory is very small. Um, so this relation is much bigger than memory. In our case, we are going to assume that memory is essentially uh, big enough to hold three records at a time for sorting. That's really toy size, but it illustrates what we are doing nicely. So I can read in three records from the relation into memory, and I'm going to do an in-memory sort. Uh, so what do I get? The first three records were G, A, D. I read it into memory and sort it. What do I get? A, D, G. And I'm going to write that out to the file. Similarly, I'll pick the next three records, C, B, and E, these three. And I'm going to sort it and write it out. So what is the sorted order I get? B, C, E. And if you see the other attribute goes along. So B, 14 comes first. C, 33 is second. And E, 16 is so these two have been written off to disk as files. Now I read the next three records, R, D, and M, and sort those and write it out. So what is the output? D, M, R. And finally, P, D, A, sorted, what is the output? A, D, P. So at the end of the step, which is called create runs, I have these four files, each of whose size is approximately the size of memory. It's going to be a little bit less because we're going to keep uh, some buffer blocks for reading in this relation and uh, some buffer blocks for writing out the output. Um, but this is uh, roughly the size of memory. It's going to be uh, memory size in blocks minus one is going to be the size of this in blocks. We'll come to that in a moment. Now the next phase is merging. Uh, so here we are doing a binary merge, which you're all familiar with. Uh, but in general, what you'll have is a KRE merge. Uh, because you don't want to do two-way merge at a time. There is enough memory typically to read in one block each from a large number of runs. So I can merge in one pass, I can merge maybe 100 runs. So the number of passes that I need to do will be much less. 
In this case, it is a toy. So, because our memory is so small, uh, we can only read in one block from each uh, of two runs and one block for output. So, it is only a two way merge. When we do a two way merge, so we can take the first two and merge them. Uh, we look at these two A D G B C E. We are looking at the first record A B, which is smaller A output A 19. Move the pointer to D 31, D 31 B 14, which is smaller B 14, that is output. Move the pointer here to C 33, C 33 D 31, which is smaller C 33, that is output. Move this pointer to E 16. Now, between D 31 and E 16, which is smaller E 6 uh, D 31, that is output. Now, our comparison is between G 24 and E 16, which is smaller E 16, that is output. Now, there is no more record here. So, we simply output all the remaining records in this run, which is simply G 24. So, the merge resulted in one run, which is uh, in this case twice the size. Supposing I merged 100 separate runs here, this run would be 100 uh, times the size of any one of these runs. And similarly, I do it for the next two to get this. And in this case, I need one more pass to merge this and this to get this. Again, in this merge pass also, the input runs are much bigger. But I only need one block to uh, input uh, data from this one, one block to input data from this one, and one block to uh, keep the output before it is written. Uh, so, um, even though these runs are much longer, I can still merge two of those runs in uh, using this really tiny memory which I have. So, that is the final output. So, that is the intuition. Now, let us look at the algorithm. The first uh, step is to create sorted runs, which works as follows. Repeatedly read uh, m blocks of the relation to memory. What is m? That is the memory size in terms of pages of blocks. I will use the term page and blocks interchangeably, means the same thing. Uh, so, I can read this much of data into memory. That is the amount of memory I have available for sorting. I will do an in-memory sort. I can use any standard in-memory sort algorithm. I could use quick sort. I could use in-memory merge sort or whatever else. So, I have an in-memory sorted run and I will write that to R i. Initially, I is 0. So, the very first thing writes to run 0. In the next one uh, time I do this, it will go to run 1 and then to run 2 and so on. And let the final value of i be n. In other words, I have created n separate runs. Um, so, uh, we want to merge those n runs. And for now, we will assume that the number of runs is less than the number of blocks of memory available. So, I am going to keep one block of memory for buffering each of the uh, n input runs and one block to buffer the output. Now, why do we want to buffer? A block is fairly big. It is going to be a few kilobytes at minimum. 16 kilobytes is fairly common these days. So, the idea is that when I read in one block, that is a min, uh, unit preferred unit for reading from disk. You can read in a single sector, but that is too small. So, the preferred unit is reading one block. And when I read that block, I have a lot of records. I can use all of them. If I read just one record, I would have to read that block again after some time to fetch the second record and the number of seeks would explode. So, here uh, I am going to do only one seek per block. So, that is why the buffer is important. And uh, now, I am going to read the first block of each run into its buffer page and then do the following. Repeatedly select the first record in sort order among all the buffer pages. So, this is where a 100 way merge also is possible. Among all the 100 runs, I will find which run has the smallest first record at this point. And that is the smallest record overall. So, I will write that to the output buffer and delete the record from its input buffer page. Now, at this point, the buffer page for that particular run may become empty. In that case, I will read the next uh, block from that run into the buffer. So, um, after that, I can continue with the merge algorithm, which is here. I will keep repeating this. Now, of course, at certain times, a particular run may become empty. We have completely processed it. So, then from that point on, I ignore that run. It does not matter anymore. And finally, there may be only one run left, um, which is non-empty. I will simply output all its records. So, that is a very simple merge algorithm. That was a one-step merge. 
in fact with today's memory sizes most of the time uh, you know when i create runs initially you know i typically will have several hundred megabytes at least uh, to create initial sorted runs so let's say i have uh, 128 mb that's a common size i create runs each of size 128 megabytes now if i assume that each uh, buffer block is uh, let's say uh, you know 100 kilobytes then 128 megabytes means i can read um, 1280 uh, blocks with 100 kilobyte blocks so i can merge 1280 roughly um, runs at one time let's round it off to 1000 runs i will merge 1000 runs at a time each run is 128 megabytes if i merge 1000 such runs i in one merge pass i can uh, sort a 128 gigabyte relation that's pretty big using 128 megabytes of memory which is pretty small okay if you had um, if you are dealing with larger relations you are almost surely using a system with much larger main memory so practically speaking um, multi step merge is not required anymore today um, but in case you need to do it uh, what happens is each time you do the merge the uh, number of runs gets divided by some factor what is that factor if i am doing a 100 way merge if i had um, you know 1000 runs initially and i can merge 100 runs at a time the number of runs after the initial merge i take the first 100 merge them i get one next 100 i merge them i get one more run so what is the output number of runs it is 1000 divided by the memory size memory size and number of blocks that is 100 which is 10 so each merge pass divides the number of runs by a factor of uh, m minus 1 technically um, because one block is for output so the number of passes uh, can be estimated as uh, forget the details in this slide uh, the total number of merge passes is here br is the number of blocks of the original relation m is the uh, size of memory and br by m is the number of initial runs because i am reading in m blocks at a time uh, in, in memory sort output now each pass decreases the number of runs by a factor of m minus 1 so the number of merge passes is ceiling of log to the base m minus 1 of br by m practically we'll assume it's just one merge pass and we'll skip the details i'm going to skip further details of the detailed costing of merge <coughs> 